Gents, gang, gang. What up? Gang, gang. JJ's on his phone, so uh, he's taking his turn to have shit internet for today. <laughs> Zach is on his tin cup, as usual. Nah, I'm on the laptop today. Calm down. I'm on the laptop. How are you? Well, hopefully it uh, holds up. But you are somewhat the uh, the main topic for today. So tell the people about your uh, your operation. Uh, it was about 92, 90 something hours from now, I'm going to be having a hip labrum. Literally, <laughs> a cam lesion and a pencil lesion on my left hip for my first surgery in about six months. From my, and then about six months after that, I'll be having my right hip done. So, how y'all doing? What's the uh, prognosis like? Months not return to play, but you know, um, yeah. the functionality. Three to probably three to four months uh, to be fully functioning as an adult, fully capacity. The expectation is for me to like return to sport six to seven potentially. So you're gonna have like two months of feeling normal before they just go straight in and do the other one. Bro, your internet. Sorry, hey, sorry. But I, I say that I'm really good on the laptop and it fucks up. All right, so for Should me in terms of like. In? Yeah, yeah, fucking knock on wood. God damn it. <laughs> All right. So for me, what I've what I've seen, what I've read, talking with our docs, and also the, I've done a few similar rehabs myself. Functionality, probably three months to be like fully functional, six to seven, and like a return to sport capacity from what I've seen. And what's what's the nature of the procedure? Are they just gonna shave it back or so we'll, I mean, from what they're telling me right now is they're just going to go in and clean, they're going to go back in, they're going to clean up the femoral head. And then if there's a pincer lesion, like they're saying on the MRI, it's not confirmed, but they think there's a pincer lesion, they'll go in, they'll clean up the hip socket, things like that. Then they'll go and repair the hip labrum. But I also know from a few other case studies and stuff I've seen from other guys, they've turned around, they've had to have cadaver replacements to the hip labrum. They've, they've had to have a cure. Pad uh, or something. Oh, Jesus, not on wood. Um, <laughs> uh, like my roommate, uh, my roommate who's actually a coach for us here, also played in the NFL for like four or five years, and he had the same surgery. He went in. They actually had to have had to have a tendon graft, and he put having a cadaver graft, and his re his rehab was like twice as long as expected because they went in without knowing prior. So it's I'm hoping cool. that's not the case. Uh, being heavy as fuck and doing tons of lateral movement isn't irritating to hips. Yeah. You know, naturally playing a combative sport for years of your life, uh, shitty quality movement in the uh, weight room, squatting more than you should, Olympic lifting more than you should, pounding movements, and also just being abnormally large, larger than the average population. You know, it seems to be the trick. So with that said... What are the big rocks that you would, you know, look to get in place in your day job? Because obviously you do return to play where you are now. What principles do you look to have in place when you do a return to play that you're going to be using on yourself? So for me, um, and I know probably if you were asked, DK, it would probably sound pretty similar. So for me, when looking at it, I'm going to look at one, understanding one, First off, what is the injury? What is the expected timeline with the physios, the, the orthos, the things of that nature? What is the expected timeline from their side of things? Two, what are the criteria of each stage we want to look at, whether it's functionality, active, active functionality, range of motion, healing, tissue capacity, uh, things like that in the early stage, just getting active range of motion, things like that. And then once you get in there, it's just general concepts where I want to look at what are the determining factors for strength around the joint, around the ligament, whatever we're going on? What are the key factors there? Then obviously, it's like anything else, we're going to move from slow to fast. Slow to fast, simple to complex, things like that. So moving from strength to speed to power, excuse me, power to speed throughout our rehab, based around the criteria, the timelines of that injury. So those are kind of the big That's markers I look forward to be at. Obviously, did I break up again? No, no, you keep going, bro. No, I was going to go. I turned to my gig room. Uh, so for me, it also, that's going to coincide too and being in many places I've been, that's also going to be limited to the type of 
medical staff you work with, some places are going to be more progressive. Some places it's going to be more ad hoc. Some places it's going to be more uh, kind of a high performance model, so to speak. So in my in kind of my resume where I've been, it's been kind of all over the place going forward. So it's kind of been where am I at? Where are the people I'm working with? Okay, let me fit around to kind of get in how I fit in based on what the kid needs. What would you say – you know, in consideration of those factors, what would you say is different about where you're at now compared to previous places you've been? What would you say are the unique kind of things you've encountered? I would say here's probably the most progressive place I've been between one, me as a practitioner and the, as a practitioner of the sports performance department, having the freedom to do whatever I need to do to get the athlete from point A to point B, regardless of training philosophy of the program, the team, the position, whatever that individual kid at, whatever the kid or athlete needs. And then the communication between myself as the rehab coordinator, whatever the hell you want to call it. And our sports med, our sports medicine, department, things like that. Uh, so he's pretty progressive. And overall, our communication between the two of us is night and day compared to a lot of other places I've been. And he himself is very <clears throat> progressive in his thought process. So it makes my job really easy to where now where it's actually an objective-based rehab to where now it's okay, what is the timeline say it should be based on the research, based on case studies, based on other things like that, but what also do we see with the athlete based off force plate data, GPS data, wellness scores, things like that, where now you start getting into the nitty-gritty. Now we know exactly where we need to be, where we should be, and we're starting to use those pieces day to day. And I haven't, I haven't, I've been able to do that by myself kind of in passing at a lot of other places, one, learning how to implement it, two, kind of using it on my own, but three, now kind of having an entire department is kind of bought into kind of moving towards that model. So it's been, it's been fun, it's been challenging, but it's been good. TK, Mr. Rehab Coordinator in a previous life. I know I tagged you a, a job opening <laughs> at the Astros today, but you've already done that. What about you? What, what's the the big things that you, you try and do with an injured athlete? Um, it's all pretty much the same, like, like what Zach said. Uh, early on, I definitely asked, like, I asked a surgeon and then, like, the PT or AT, whatever I'm working with, like, what are the, what are the things you need to see at, if it's a long, if it's a long term, like, say it's a cam lesion hip or a shoulder labrum or whatever, something long. What are the things you need to see before you allow this person to, like, be fully in that, like active in sport, and then like just working backwards from there. Um, I try, I try to get all communication also with like the surgeon, like involved, just because some say so yeah, some surgeons who would be really kind of micromanaging a little bit, and just like calm their own brain a little brain, like to communicate to them. But if they have one that's more hands off, they're not worried about it. And it's pretty much the same thing, like very extensive first, like that, that early stage very like PT, AT led, they're like wound care, wound healing, just trying to avoid an infection. Um, then progressing from there from like to like function and strength, like just building some general hypertrophy in the area. If you have like breast and girth measurements, it always helps. Um, trying yeah, to be that's objective. Right. Yeah, we're trying yeah. to be like, uh, <laughs> trying to be as objective as possible, like throughout the process and take away some of the guesswork if you have it. Like that's a nice part about the Astros is that I had access to tons of tools and so I could always objectively say like no this person can't run or yes this person's like at that stage and able to just quantify every single thing like my two ACL guys at the Astros we, we jump I jumped them at a minimum once a week most of the time two or three times a week um my cartilage replacement kid like single leg iso squat test on a force play once a week until he was able to like jump a little bit. They even did some maximum camera movement jump and a single guy so squat. So having that like object like objectiveness about it like helps a lot. And they help then the tracking when they're post injury as well, like keeping up with some of those assessments just to see where they're at, see how they're responding to being in full training, how they're responding to playing games, they're playing games. But I think the bigger one is just like just slowly progressing things and like not trying to rush people back. Just because the coach wants him to play, it's like I don't give a fuck. The coach wants him to play. The coach is be mad. This person gets re-injured one game in. So, so do, you get them, do you get them to agree on the front end about 
what are the criteria that everyone needs to understand that that's the, like the hard no, like you have to pass that before they come back? Yeah, so like we'll, so much we try to do is like laid out all the principles and criteria early on. And that was like on the front end of like, and it's communicated to the player as well. Like, hey, like you're not, you're not going to next stage until you're at least within 10% of this marker. Mm-hmm. Like at a minimum. And then if you're, not, if you're 20%, 30%, like you're not moving on until we improve that. Unless for some strange reason, like it was otherwise. But I, in the pro setting way, I say you do have to have some le- leeway based on where guys are in their career. Cause some guys are just trying to keep a fucking job. So like- Some injuries do this like, I always think like an Achilles, sometimes like you never get that muscle girth back. Yeah. <laughs> and so for some of it's like injury based, where someone's at, like some of our older, like our older guys, like we were, we could push them far, like a bit faster and like Tommy John, things like that, just because like those, we need those, those dudes are needed in the big leagues. Those, oh, maybe on the last year of their contract, they need to pitch. And so like, there's that kind of factor as well. So you can be, have some leeway. But for the most part, generally speaking, like you always have to be objective, always be criteria based as possible before you move people on. Have your AT and PT involved in conversations early. And and times calm is there because they're more risk averse anyway, not naturally. So having them involved in the process and them also understanding those roles and responsibility. Like, hey, once they're past that acute response, like early stage stuff. Like they don't spend. It should be sixty forty in terms of like time with the SSC performance that versus time with the AT. Like they don't need to be in the in the AT room doing a million clamshells a day. Like that's a waste of their fucking time. Like let's do things that are gonna like, drive adaptation and push them forward. And so I think having that be open and honest about hey, like once they're past this early stage, like they're no longer your full responsibility. Like they're now mostly mine. And they're like, gonna be involved in the loop, but it's not really there. Their wheelhouse, you know. We, yeah, exactly. Uh, someone on this call that I used to work with, he, he and I once witnessed, we, we had a, an athlete that was like needed a minor modification to a barbell back squat. And uh, we said to one of the medics, can you, can you please regress this back squat? And the regression was body weight squat on an inverted uh, Bozu ball. <laughs> so not, not quite the regression we were looking for. And then proceeded to the body brought up. An appraisal. I was to say, it's funny you bring that up because I was at a school within like the last two years. Uh, and AT told me, well, you know, in the when I'm bringing it back to, to you, the strength coach, I, you know, I like to clean them and I like to do like all like the Olympic list and all that. And his excuse was because I like doing them because I do them myself. And just in my mind, I'm just like, uh, so, listen here, lad. I don't come down to the alley and knock the cocks out of your mouth when you're trying to work. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. You know what? I'm just going to start coming to the training. That message was but... brought to you by our sponsor, Team Builder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Can we get Team Builder to sponsor a GoFundMe for a cell tower in Oxford, Mississippi? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it says Scott Kuhn's network bandwidth is low. So keep talking all that shit, fucking... You right, just, you just changed the screen true. name to that to make you feel better. <laughs> but all the serious, seriously though, like going off of what TK said, like in the college setting, what I've seen, and I know all Scott and Kerry, you guys have seen this stuff too. College is the complete opposite. Unless you get like the perfect situation when it comes to like sport coaches, ATs and like ATs strength department, like athletic performance or whatever the hell you want to call it, can be on the same page. But 99% of your time, as soon as you get to the sport coaches, it's like, uh, I hope they make it. Just like, for example, like here, like I had a all SEC multi year starting wide receivers. I gave them a pitch count based off this GPS with catapult because all my rehab kids, the day they start their first dynamic warm up with me, they get a catapult. Essentially, give them a, a, cat, a pitch count for my rehab kid. Like this kid, this is his numbers he can hit. And I give them like a range. Like if, if you will probably be about this many plays, you can do this, this, this here. Go to I, I get done with my rehab kids during practice. I look at the lap, I look at the iPad. This kid's got nine thousand yards, and he's supposed to be on a pitch count. And I'm just like, what the hell? Or like a hamstring, hamstring kid I had at a school one time. Literally played a game and a half of football in three quarters of practice. And as the ball is getting snapped, and I'm telling the trainer, "Hey, old boy needs to get pulled out of practice for the second time." 
10 seconds later, he goes put foot to the ground, goes across against the grain, against the DB, and his hamstring pops again. And literally 10 seconds after, I was like, hey, this kid needs to get pulled out. He's literally more than doubled his volume for me. Like, this kid was always supposed to be the first six periods of practice, and we're now in period 14. I so. used to call that was um... – I forget which GPS company it was, but they were trying to incorporate stuff like that so that rather than you were just running around with a clipboard trying to convince sport coaches, you know, they need to be pulled, that you could pre-program the loads, you know, that, that absolute limit. it was like the absolute, well, you pre-program the loads that you want, but then they would build it into the vest that once you exceeded that threshold, it would vibrate to like alert the athlete. And I just thought that would be- I believe that it's catapult through system. Uh, oh, really? back to you. Yeah, because I saw they had like they're integrating a watch app as well. So you could have it to where they get a notification on the watch that they are hitting their threshold for the day. Um, and they're still like from what my contact there told me, they're still kind of like trialing it and figuring out. Because one of the things I told them was like it would be kind of dope if you could periodize your workloads day by day based on you know whichever metric you're trying to anchor on. Mm. Um, and they said it's in early stages right now of just like being able to at least kind of have those thresholds set, like you said, so that you get that alert when they hit that target and you can cut them there. That would just be some like even fancier tech for sport coaches to ignore. Yes. I mean, that Sports already has that with the watch. The only person to watch is like the ton of dollars. So you can get Fuck one Stat of them. Sports. Shit, yes. And then like, product. bro, I'm trying to get sponsors here. Okay, yeah, JJ, cut that out. But fuck that sport. Leave it in, JJ. It's funny. JJ, talk to me about uh-huh. rehab, bro. You, you uh-huh. rehabbed teenagers, so time, obviously, is on your side. Yeah. Um, I guess it's the yeah, same as the other guys say in terms of how you're going to do it. I guess the only thing I'd add in is, especially in the youth setting, as we've talked about before, it's the stakeholders involved. Mm. So it's not like, you know, I do the rehab and then they go to – the club and they do more rehab and then they go to the academy and do more rehab in the oh. same day. Don't you talk about bath rugby like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just, you know, trying to communicate between everyone involved, parents as well. Um, and then the, the athlete, especially because they're kids. So they think, Oh, I can't feel it anymore. So it's, it's fine. It's like, no, you're two months off an ACL to, you know, I, I trained a guy who was playing in the NRO the day he turned 18 and he was like fucking people up. He tore his ACL and I want to say six months post ACL and bear in mind, we were flogging him to get him back. And he was playing pickup basketball with one of the other guys who was probably on half a million bucks a year. And they were playing pickup basketball in preseason after the high days. He subsequently had another ACL, but not that year. So I rehabbed him that like I, I want to say I rehabbed him from his second ACL. So, yeah. He's 18. He was probably 19. Because the the final youth cut off there is 20s. And he he was playing NRL at 18, so he just skipped 20s. I think he had one year and he tore his ACL and then I arrived and I kind of did the bulk of the rehab. That man needed some go-to. <laughs> All right. Any, any more, brother? Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, no, it's, it's not like the other guys say. Try and be as objective as possible. From my point of view, time's on my side. Um, although sometimes you wouldn't think so with the parents involved. It's like, no, little Johnny's got his academy game coming up. He needs to be fit for that. He's going to play for England. JJ, He's not. he doesn't. JJ, let me ask you this. So, with the age group you you were dealing with, how much of a factor would you say was actual like healing time based around the in- injury itself, and the fact that some of these fuckers were just getting shot up with like internal injections of the hormone and puberty on daily, to where they were healing so. How much of like how much did you see in a, in seeing that like a difference or account for that? I mean, they definitely kids heal faster. Um, that's but it's more. It, it depends on the injury. So like if it come from a surgery thing, I think that's a big impact is the psychological element of it. 
because that's pretty traumatic for them to go through. Um, so that it's more fear, fear factor. But you can definitely rattle through the, the loading stages, I think, faster with them just because of how quickly they adapt and respond. Um, you know, if you're, if you're getting really any muscle or tissue injuries, like if you're tearing hamstrings in kids, you are doing some whack shit with them to achieve that. Ben Urbano, bro. Ben Urbano was, if he sat down to eat at the dinner table, he would go into posterior tilt. He has the, I mean, look at him. He has the worst anatomy possible for hamstring health. And he was probably, at that age, he was probably like 115 kilos. Oh my God. We used to have some problems with him. But yeah. hamstrings. Yeah, speaking, dude, of, speaking, just, speaking of hamstrings, so and, fucking strong, and just yeah, he you know he was the man for knowledge. So he was playing every minute for knowledge. He was doing all the academy shit, and yeah, fuck it, he made it though. Man. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this though. Just speaking about hamstrings, and again, like I know the realm of sports I've worked with particularly, but I would say like with football, that's probably the most poorly most studied but also most grossly misunderstood and under rehabbed or hamstring strength whether it's a grade one grade two grade three the amount of kids that get thrown back into re that never actually go through a full objective like rehab or true rehab from a hamstring just get thrown back in like a week later whether it's off season in season that's probably the most poorly rehabbed and probably most studied injury within like collegiate football that I've ever that I've seen and a lot of the, and a lot of the injuries I've seen, speaking of that, when it comes to the hamstring itself, are just gross and complex of understanding of like load, of like actual total load and volume. Most of these like aren't intensity issues that I've seen with guys, because most of these programs don't run fast enough for it to actually be a velocity issue. Where just these kids, like you just talked about, are just getting clogged with the volume daily. We were talking about seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand, nine thousand yards consecutively. Right, I was. Um... I'll name you Shane. University of Richmond. So I would just say that's the biggest thing. It's it's interesting to see because everybody talks about it, but there's no actual. I'm back. I'm back. Everybody talks about it, but there's no like real like actual like development improving it. So I just think that's interesting. Mate, that where I played two years ago. I had a bunch of guys that there was like any anytime you've got a hamstring group, you fucked up straight away. But we had these guys that were just like recurring hamstrings. And I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to, like, take control of it. So I was like, right, we're going onto the field, and we're just going to do, like, low-level A skips and prime times and stuff like that. And then if you feel really, really good, then we'll start doing sleds, and then we'll go fives, tens, fifteens, twenties, blah, 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 to get them up to speed. And the head athletic trainer walked out and said, no, 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 this is, this is far too risky. And obviously it was going and do uh, Swiss ball leg curls and uh, – band climb shows and my retort was you know that thing that they keep break keep breaking doing perhaps we should learn how to be masters of that and not break doing it but anyway i was not here we have a player here two years ago her last team they sat some some australian dude that was like their snc coach or whatever but uh she had strained the same hamstring four times and was out for six months but essentially it was the same injury four different times and the same as that spot every single time and she said her rehab consisted of no running at all, no sprinting ever, um, nothing with the ball. It was just like a bunch of like back extensions and like leg curls and shit like that. And then like uh, some kind of fitness, like coat hanger, like test thing, like running. And then, okay, put the play back in the game. Back in the play like 90 minutes. Wow. So mine. Stuff that hasn't been covered. Um, I think the training that rehabs injuries is the same training that creates regular adaptation. It's just the, the starting point is a lot lower and the cost of uh, error is a lot higher. Um, it's also possible that although just like a regular, regular athlete, there's going to be a weak link in the chain that limits the system. It's probably going to be a different... Uh, weak link compared to a healthy athlete so I think that's important to to bear in mind all the stuff that you guys talked about in terms of like there's there's going to be key landmarks um, there's going to be 
a key practitioner that handles the process at each stage and there needs to be good communication of all the relevant information and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think, like you said, the goal is always to return to what you were before, if not better. And to do that, you have to have an idea of what you were before. So you ha actually have to, before they get hurt, be really diligent and consistent in how you collect your data or, you know, just have positional averages if you can't do that. And then a problem that I found earlier in my career is obviously being too focused on intensity of like, you know, here's, here's all the criteria, here's the, the progression for sprinting, changing direction, grappling, jumping, lifting, blah, 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 doing all that stuff. And then thinking that because they could do it, my job was done. When in reality, they have to be able to do it at the kind of densities and volumes that they're going to be doing in sport practice and probably more because you need that margin of error when the sport coaches throw the plan out the window. So my preference was always to make the return to play or the, you know, the week that they return to full participation with the team actually be a deload. So I would go, you know, average demands plus one standard deviation. Um, so I think, you know, probably intensity first and then just accumulating volume as they go. Um, and then I think like one, one final thing for me is like the brain is the last thing to be rehabbed. So it's, it's started to be validated a little bit with the, uh, the data where I think it's like six times higher off the top of my head rate of re-injury for anxious athletes compared to uh, non-anxious athletes. So one of the things that I tried to incorporate a William and Mary obviously never saw through to a completion was uh, one of the um, KPIs in the final stage. So I think we had like four Ps. It was like uh, something prepare, uh, some a power perform. And then, the, you know, the first P was like healing or something, but one of the criteria the for the perform. Protect. Pardon me? protect? Yes, protect the joint, yeah. So... Yeah, that final P, it, you had to have a sit down with the sports side and be like, you know, are you ready for this? And uh, make sure that you're not pushing an athlete out on, onto the field that didn't want to be there because you're probably creating problems for yourself down the line. Keane. I think a lot of my lens towards RTP and like I haven't done, you know, I've gotten guys at later stages of long-term rehabs, but I've been able to do a lot of acute rehabs as well. Um, that's kind of been my wheelhouse uh, and a lot of that stemmed from my experience as an athlete to where my freshman year of college hamstring issues right off the bat in fall camp because surprise surprise three hour practices every single day uh tend to make kids break especially kids that are overly physically developed like I was and it was you know three days of chair scoots ankle weight hamstring curls and four-way hip and then throw you back out there and surprise surprise it goes again oh. and uh, I think I did that five, four or five times over the course of my entire freshman year. And it was just frustration after frustration of, you know, they, you do a hamstring and they throw through bullshit rehab, which in my opinion, the neg to Zach's point, the negligence that it is to me should be an act of omission that they should know far better how to, how to rehab and what they're preparing the athletes to do or rehabbing them to be able to do. And the fact that it's overlooked for five pound ankle weights and fucking mini bands to do clamshells and four way hip width is gross negligence in my opinion. Um, but, you know, they, they do that and they poorly manage your rehab and then you're completely removed from anything resembling what the team's doing. And so a lot of what I look to do in rehab and this was, I was pretty, formed by my time at Kentucky in this because um, Corey Edmund there always talked about keeping plan A as close to, or plans B through Z as close to plan A as you possibly can with respect that's to. Right. Dan Path talked about it and Corey Edmund used it. Let's get that straight, baby. That's fair. That's Corey. That's that's Corey, fair. Yeah. Uh, head strength coach at Kentucky currently in football. Um, but, uh, and so then just seeing some of the ways that they would load athletes who may have been contraindicated. Like the one that I remember standing out to me was like, there was a kid that, wasn't supposed to put any load on his foot or his ankle and so Corey had him doing like basically like a, a hip clean from a, a tall kneeling position on a pad and 
keeping it as close to that versus just saying, you know, let's throw everything out the window and you'll just do nothing or you'll just go arbitrarily do single leg press. And so looking at it as that and how you can, okay, if they don't have a limb accessible to them, can they do it on one limb? If they don't have both limbs accessible for some reason, can they go to a tall kneeling? Can they, what keeps them as close to what the rest of the team's doing and keeps them as engaged with the team as possible without just casting them to the side and making them may, be made to feel like an outcast or, you know, not part of the team because of something that resulted from uh, sport coaches that don't know what the hell they're doing from performance coaches that aren't prepping them for the demands of sport or for, from athletic trainers who have no idea what the hell it is they're rehabbing them for. Um, and it's just, it perpetuates, like you talked about the brain's the last thing to heal. It just perpetuates this very negative downward spiral that I remember being at a very, very low point in my sophomore year because I was having hamstring issues again and just wondering if it was ever going to go away. And then you have these coaches that are ridiculing you to get back and feeling like you're faking it for some reason. Um, and it's just, it, there's just a very in the wrong situations, which I think a lot of college athletics tends to be because people don't recognize the complexity of injury or how they contribute to the emergence of them. Um, it, it can be a very, very negative process. And so at least from my standpoint of things that I can control, just trying to keep them as close to what the team is doing as possible and, and looking to get them moving as quickly as possible. Like if kids are walk, if they can walk without an asymmetry to me, they can be with me, whether that's doing an ankle dribble march, a calf dribble march, something where they are doing things that begin to resemble the activities that, like you said, they're breaking from and get them moving again and preparing those tissues for higher amplitudes of movement, higher frequencies, higher ground reaction forces, all the things that are going to eventually build them back towards being able to tolerate full intensities and then tolerate volumes of those intensities and then eventually tolerate them in a denser time scale. Um, so just for me, it's all about keeping them as close to plan A as possible and making sure they are, what they are doing is as representative of what the team is doing uh, while respecting what's contraindicated for them at that stage of their rehab. Yeah, bro. I mean, <clears throat> some places it's like the, the return to play group is like a leper colony. <laughs> They're just like shunned from the group. And it's just like, it's a terrible vibe. Everyone's <laughs> drinking sappuccinos. And I think it's like, if, if they can be in the main session, but with heavy modification, you know, it's a lot easier to just look at what's going on. You know, if you're the return to play guy, <clears throat> what I always tried to do when I was in rugby, because typically you have three guys in rugby, it would basically be like, have one, one guy drive the session, one assistant do everyone else that's healthy, and then have one dedicated return to play guy. Because obviously, to me, those ratios need to be like way, way lower, because obviously the cost of error is that much higher. It's way easier to just like look at what the main body of the session is. If you're the RTP guy, just modify ahead of time what everyone's going to do. And then that is like a massive uh, carrot to dangle in front of injured athletes because they want to be around their peers and they want to see that, you know, they're getting closer. And um, yeah, and that was one thing that really pissed me off about Japan. It was just like you had guys that when they had an ACL just wouldn't pick up a ball for four or five months. It's just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> TK will attest to that. Yeah. yeah, I would say that you you bring that up, and I, like and just for primacy, I think the other thing you see too is other schools they like try to like not schools, but even like programs or schools, organizations they almost like outcast kids like that. And you talk about like the psychological factor. It's bad enough. They they were like were like I've been places, uh, multiple places. Normally when I come to a place, well, you're the return to play guy. Like you have to train these guys outside of the team time because you have oh, to be. Wow. Like, like, I need you to be focused on the guys at hand, the guys here. Like, you have to, like, okay, cool. Like, that's fine. Like, I'm all for it. But I'm telling you right now, everywhere I've been, when you keep those guys away from the team, when you keep those guys away from the team, like, over, like, the way you like, there's, like, like your own, like, leper colony, like the, the GIMP squad, so to speak, as I like to call them, the GIMP squad. Team rice paper. Yeah. And, like, they all, they all, like, they all end up going through, like, their own, like, psychological personal warfares in their own head. But when you single them out like that, like even like I had a kid here who broke his arm. He had, he was uh before I got here against LSU, he had his arm, the forearm fracture and still healing. 
he had a linebacker was making a tackle, and he just happened to get his arm stuck between a running back and a, one of our starting linebackers shattered his forearm. The kid was, like, fighting, like, mental Vietnam every single day because he was, like, outcasted from the group for so long. And it's, like, if you, for me, it's, like, okay, like, it'll kind of go to – I had to go to my boss. It's, like, you know, like, let's get these guys in groups, even, though like, if it's going to put more strain on me because I have to coach more guys. My main session guys are self-sufficient. If I tell them what to do, like, they're going to be fine. That's going to make sure – quote, unquote, they don't die. And I can focus on my return mm -hmm. to play guys because there's a, four other coaches plus interns to help me with my main session guys. But now it's to the point where these guys need to get integrated back into being around the team, even if it's like in a lot of team run situations. These guys, like Scott, everybody's kind of talked about the importance that like, people don't realize these guys, especially like big group teams, that these guys have to be involved around their team. Where, again, they have to feel part of the community. Because a lot of these guys, especially the collegiate setting, when they get injured, you see – their grades drop. They start getting other shit. Their personal lives are mixed up. Girlfriend issues, family issues, like every all the shit hits the fan at once when they get isolated like that. And they end up being like this different person, and it takes them forever, forever to crawl out of the hole. Dude, I was on a ledge my sophomore year when it happened again, and I was just getting pressure from the coaches because they thought I was like, it was like a here we go again. He's doing the hamstring thing like he did last year. And it's doing like, the hamstring thing. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, as a walk on, I wanted to be hurt to where I couldn't play, and would just be made to sat out and do three hours of bullshit workouts that strength coaches could come up with. Muscle fucking beach, baby. Right. Let me let me tell you a fucking story. Right, there was now obviously right. It's it's bullshit because the the idea is is like you go into camp. You just kick everyone squarely in the fucking dick. So they're absolutely miserable and they hate life. And then naturally, when you do that to the human body, a lot of people break. And then the immediate response is, oh, he, he's just fucking faking it. Make him do muscle beach. Or one, if that is the response to the training that you scheduled, your training fucking sucks. And two, they're still probably not faking it. I have witnessed a kid. He had a surgery to the point where he was in a boot and on crutches and they still made him fucking pad up and put on a helmet. And do muscle <laughs> beach. It's like, did he fake getting a fucking scalpel put into his ankle? <laughs> that's, every, that's fucking everywhere because it's, you know, everybody, everybody has to be the same. The standard is the standard. If we're in full pads, you're in full pads. For what? Which works because every team goes undefeated every single year. And that's why all the isms about culture and team camaraderie work at every single school right if it's, if it's copied it's not culture just okay it, it, in some situations like i've seen it before like some kids like these kids are softer than baby shit they couldn't find their way out of a wet paper bag and both that, then. Just and there's, that. there's just certain kids like they could find their way of a wet paper bag and both ends rope sure those fuckers can show up ride the bike do calorie sprints on the on the salt bike whatever till they Bombing the fucking bottom of their helmet, sure, whatever. But the kids are like actually have issues. Like, let them get their work in and let them actually get back to the field to help you win ball games. Like, do what do what is needed, not what is wanted. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything that makes you better, at an explosive sport that requires repeated bouts of five seconds of max intensity, it's two hours of calisthenics. <laughs> and on that, gentlemen, I'm gonna stop recording. Bye, team building. <laughs>